Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me. And um, I'm going to be presenting on the closing the semantic gap, the structured method for knowledge retention. So uh, just give you a, a warning that there's going to be a couple of QR codes and a couple of links that you might want to have your cameras ready to capture, or maybe we'll just get it on the recording. Um, knowledge retention is a, a big component of, of uh, my book, Data Governance Needs Risk Management, which was co-written with my partner, Terry Smith. Um, first of all, we have a, a, um, rep, um, a thing where we do acknowledgement of country. So I'm going to acknowledge the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of all lands, waters and sky, where we live and work. And I pay respects to their elders past and present and extend our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples. Okay, I'd like to give a, a shout out to my co-founder uh, co and business partner, Terry Smith. So um, Terry Smith is from a, a long background in, in data modeling and data warehousing, starting our first data analysis, data model and data warehouse back in 1988. Um, she doesn't look that old, I'll tell you. Um, but without her, I would not have um, embarked on this journey of language and modeling. So I, I first met Terry in um, 1998 um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee on, a, on an insurance client. Um, and my first data, data warehouse was back in about 1995. So my background is manufacturing and process engineering. So I'm not from an IT background. So I did move in to um, data warehousing and business intelligence from kind of from a business side um, and uh, engineering side. Um, but together, Terry and I have seen many, many data warehouses. We've been involved in many data warehouse and business intelligence designs, and uh, we've seen what works and what doesn't. And mostly what works is when we have the business engaged, um, we have business definition, and we have business governance. So ultimately, we're trying to solve a business problem. So whilst our um, talks uh, today and yesterday so far have been from a very technical nature, I'm going to come and look at it from the business side because I, I, I want to see how we can bring business and technology together uh, more seamlessly. We've um, basically working at uh, problems of lost organisational memory. Um, and because of that, we get um, poor definition, ineffective infotech spend, and ultimately regulatory non-compliance. So we need to get our data to solve these business problems. And how do we do that? And the root cause is essentially that we have this knowledge retention issue. And because we are uh, not able to clearly define our um, business requirements, especially as you know, we've, we've just gone through a, a long period where data modeling was um, out of vogue. Fortunately, there's been a, um, a resurgence in data modeling, which is really good. So we can start to get um, the business engagement again, get those uh, clear requirements. Um, and with re, um, without those clear requirements, we get unreliable uh, information through ineffective tech spend. Um, and that leads to the regulatory non-compliance. So we have a vicious cycle here. Now, the biggest complaint I hear from the technology people I work with is they have a problem getting business engagement. So how do we get that um, business engagement? Well, first of all, let's look at some of the, the stats in terms of um, project um, project failures. So back in when I did my uh, uni back in the 90s, um, early 90s for software engineering, one of the uh, stats that were thrown around was project failures were in the high 30s, 40 percent. And a lot of it was blamed on the semantic gap. So over the years, we've been trying to change, uh, trying to uh, close that semantic gap. And this has been done through a variety of um, uh, software development techniques and case tools. But where we're coming from is looking at it from the, the, from the business side. So if we can solve part of that uh, semantic gap you, uh, by improving business language and, and the ambiguity around 
uh, business language, then we can better define our information needs. Um, so this has led to the development of um, our award-winning intraline ecosystem. And from that, the book covers really a four-point strategy for bringing the business people um, and getting them engaged. And the, the focus of the rest of this presentation is going to be on knowledge. So the four points are knowledge. So getting organizational know what and know how and capturing that. Using the process of capturing that knowledge and those definitions to build communities of practice. So what, what I talk about is sociality and building that community of practice so that we can start to get business engaged in data governance. I will touch briefly also on the other two points, which is better investment in infotech and uh, resources. So managing our um, business resources so that everybody has what they need to succeed. Uh, as I said, we've we've uh, culminated that into the into the book. So we have here a QR code. Uh, the publisher of the book has very kindly put a 50% discount uh, code. There is uh, Ken Gap 2023. The URLs there and the QR code if you would like to go and have a look at this book, uh, which goes into a lot more detail, particularly in the knowledge area. Um, as part of working with the, the business community and solving the uh, building the communities of practice, we're also working at building business capability through education, um, working uh, with them to ensure that we're, we're in a no blame culture so that we get visibility of issues and business drivers that you know people need to be able to talk about. With the language management, we want to build accountability and of course, what gets measured gets done. So we want measurability around the governance, particularly governance of the language. So I'll dive a little bit now into the knowledge and how did we solve um, some of the, the issues around, uh, around language and knowledge capture. So essentially, we have this saying, um, what you think I said is not what I think you heard. Uh, we've all had the experience of being in a, a meeting room and there's some people talking and you you know they're in um, they're in agreement in violent agreement but they think they're disagreeing or conversely they seem to be agreeing with each other but you can tell that they're actually misunderstanding each other if you if you have a good business analyst head then you would recognize these things so this was the driving force for us and essentially the reason this happens is because of ambiguity. And there are three kinds of ambiguity. So the first one here is lexical ambiguity. I'm not sure how well this um, relates to other languages, but in English, and I apologize for being very focused on the English language here, but um, over 80% of our common words have more than one meaning. And there's a few examples then when we talk about an account, are we talking about a financial record? Are we talking about an arrangement with a customer? Or are we talking about a report or description of an event, an account of an event? The second kind of um, ambiguity is syntactic ambiguity. And this is uh, very much around how we structure our sentences. So if our definitions are written in a way that the sentence structure causes ambiguity, we're going to have problems. Example here, so the professor said on Monday he would give an exam. Did the professor say this on Monday or is he giving the exam on Monday? So this is where we have a prepositional phrase and the position of that prepositional phrase can cause ambiguity. The next one, visiting relatives can be exhausting. Are we using the verb form of visiting or are we using a participle such a, a verbal such that the verb is actually working as an adjective? So we're describing the, the relatives. Let's stop controlling people. So again, are we using an adjective form or are we using the verb form? Are we talking about people who are controlling or are we talking about us controlling people? And then we have determiners. 
the cat chased the mouse until it stumbled and fell. Is it the cat or the mouse? And then, of course, we have our conjunctions and and or. Does this mean we're going to bring wine and dessert or beer and dessert or wine or beer and dessert? You get what I mean? So how do we solve this ambiguity? Oh, sorry, third type of ambiguity, almost forgot. Um, textual ambiguity, and this is where we get our um, abbreviations and acronyms. And of course, an acronym is just a kind of abbreviation that you can say. Um, these are very, very common. When we, in fact, I've coming through this conference, I've had to look up an awful lot of abbreviations to try and understand what they mean in the particular context. And when we go into meeting rooms, quite often we'll hear a lot of uh, 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 abbreviations being used, and we've often will will ask, "Excuse me, can you tell me what that means?" And quite often the people don't actually know. So it's very important to understand our, our abbreviations. But our abbreviations can, in some cases, save us a little bit. There's a bit of a story I'm going to tell you here. So Terry and I were doing a, a, a warehouse for a, a big telco here in Australia. And um, we were supposed to go live the following week. And I was very concerned that the person who was um, building the, um, the ELT um, transformation logic for the, the, the finance piece, the billing piece, was a bit behind. So at the end on Friday, we had a look at the code that had been written and it was very sparse. It was obviously not going to be finished before the go live date the following week. So I said to Terry, I'm afraid we're going to have to work the weekend. And um, so we went in and we we looked at the, the code. We wrote all the modules that we needed and we needed to write some audit modules as well. So we wrote the audit modules and I needed some a few codes to describe the various states of the audit. And we chose I chose OK as being, you know, everything's fine. But at the other end, I decided to just because a bit of fun and we were going to change it before it went into production. I used the code FU. So anyway, we forgot all about it. It went live and, and during the uh, handover to the production team, the production manager said, can you tell me what the code FU means? So I said, oh, that's uh, failed unconditionally. So how do we solve ambiguity? We have developed what we call the interline definitions uh, standard, which is a means of structuring our definitions into simple what we call uh, business rules. So very similar to Graham's presentation there, we, we structure our rules such we have the subject. In this case, we're defining what a business term is. And we have, first of all, a classification rule. So we have 13 different kinds of rule types, but I'm going to focus on just the classification and functional rules for the rest of the presentation. So a business term, what is it? It's a name. And then we have our option phrases. So every time we introduce a um, um, a conjunction, we start a new line. So what does it do? The functional rule, what does it do? Business term is a name that will identify a business concept and will have one meaning. So you can see we're using these modal verbs, the same as Graham is using. We, we use must, will, shall, should, can and may. So rather than the may not, we use should as the not sure whether it's uh, optional or mandatory. Um, we allow a single prepositional phrase into any one um, business rule, and we also allow quantifying phrases. So whenever we have a plural, we always quantify it to say, you know, how many, um, how many are there. Um, moving on, the benefits here is I can read the definition each line independently. So for example, if I come back here, I can say business term is a name. Is that true or false? Business term will identify a business concept. Is that true or false? Business term will have one meaning to the business. That might generate some arguments, but ultimately that's what we're trying to get to. We have one meaning for, for each term, one definition for each term. And if we have 
multiple definitions for a term, then we need to qualify the term such that we, we're separating them into individual concepts. We can then evaluate and approve with the stakeholder community. We can describe the term's relationship be, be, with other terms. So you can see we have a relationship between business term and name, business term and business concept, business term and words and so on. Um, and by uh, classifying in a hierarchy with the taxonomy, we are um, inheriting the definition of, of, the, of the hyponym. So we're building an ontology and a taxonomy in the business language. This also helps us with data modeling, and we've pr proven that by working with these definitions first and then feeding them to the data modeler, it makes the data modeling uh, a much more rapid process. Here are some examples um, that I've plugged in. So you can see all the orange words there are our uh, relationships between the term that's being defined and the related terms. We also draw our words from a WordNet dictionary. So every word that we use is a, is a very definite sense of meaning for that word. So we, we're building a controlled vocabulary at the same time. You can see here we have employee is a person, a claimant is a person, part-time employee is an employee. So part-time employee is inheriting this definition, but then we are describing how it is different from other members of its class. So here we're saying that it'll work less than the total hours of a standard work week and will receive the employee benefits on a pro rate, pro rata basis, et cetera. And we can then produce a, a graph, and I'm not going to um, call this a DAG, um, which I think is a, a um, is the directional um, acyclic graph. The only reason there is because in Australia, a DAG is a piece of um, wool and sheep's droppings that hangs on the back of a sheep's backside. So we don't use the word DAG. Um, I've taken some examples from Graham's definitions as well. So you can see here that I've, um, I've, I've applied a couple of his um, uh, definitions from his examples. And uh, uh, yeah, you, I'll just let you look at those. But the real power is then bringing this into a workshop. So we've got issue driven priority. We always work from an issues perspective and we're working in the in the workshop by focusing on those key questions. What is it? Why do we have it or what it, what is it or what is the consequence of having it? And by bringing our business community together, we can listen for discrepancies and disagreements which are the clues to the ambiguity, and we can start to build um, our, our definitions in natural language in the class, on the workshop, on the, on the whiteboard. The benefit here also is we, we tend to find it easy to get buy-in and ownership of the definition, so accountability of the definition going forwards. Um, and in building these um, these definitions with with the workshop we are building that community of of practice we're getting people in, involved we have a saying when we're we're not building a glossary we're building a community because if you've got a glossary with no community there's no point you need to build that community at the same time there's another qr code there which is a discussion on workshops versus one-on-one -on -one, um interviews and uh, there's, there's been quite a lot of engagement with that. Um, so sociality is building that society of, of, of people together around uh, the, the core terms and their, their stakeholder community for those sets of terms. So they are a dynamic, te uh, dynamic communities of practice. Um, and we are setting these people up to focus on issue resolution uh, do their internal marketing in terms of communication and education to, within the business community. And ultimately, this builds the awareness of, of the importance of information management and govern, governance. So we are tackling that semantic gap from the business side as well as 
the technology side with the case tools. I'm going to have a quick um, uh, look at uh, the infotech side of things. And of course, we've all seen this, this particular diagram. Um, what we're doing here is focusing on that um, uh, behavior of focusing on solution. We see quite often technology being implemented just because it's it's the CIO's uh, favorite technology, or it's the um, it's the enterprise architect's uh, chosen tool. I come from a systems background, and I always apply systems thinking to um, to the my approach here. So many times I've seen um, ERP systems being replaced without consideration of the impact that causes to business process. Um, and data quality, data migration, and so on, which are never factored into the projects. So by bringing our knowledge, the definitions, sociality and systems thinking together, we get clear term definitions. We focus on issue resolution. We build communities of practice, uh, uh, practice and we therefore get more effective engagement with, with the uh, technology people. We get better, uh, better results, better dashboards, better data warehouses and so on. And I do want to call out here to um, um, to Peter yesterday for the Data Vault Builder because I think that's a fantastic tool. It's, it's a very flexible um, architecture and it, it solves that argument of, you know, do I go in Mong, do I go um, um, just, just Data Vault and Business Vault? or Kimball or whatever. Um, ultimately, I'm just going to have a quick look here at resources because we're also trying to get um, we're trying to get to a point where we have the business people looking after their artifacts. There is also another point I want to make here in that business terms and data are not a one to one relationship. In order to really resolve those differences, we need to understand the artifact that would sit between a business term and the data that underlies it. And by managing those artifacts, which may be data extracts or SQL queries um, or the code underneath dashboards, the dashboards themselves, spreadsheets, policies, procedures, these are all artifacts that are of key importance to our business community. Um, and we're taking the business ownership also as an important point here. Um, ownership is not an, a word that's liked in a lot of organizations. They they tend to take on other words such as stewardship, custodian, etc. We found that the structure of using a library type structure of having head librarian who is accountable for their library content and the library con contains the business terms for that library it contains sections of artifacts that are curated. So the curators and the librarians are responsible people. The librarian and authors for the business terms, so you have responsible people here. And then uh, those artifacts and business terms are related so that you can search for the artifacts using business terms and you can define the scope of an artifact using the business terminology. Um, this is. Thank you. This is uh, just a summary of the of the strategy. So capturing knowledge, building sociality, managing better our infotech and then managing the resources that are produced by that infotech. We believe everyone should have access to what they need to succeed and going beyond our workplaces. Um, we donate to the Global Goals Initiative of Quality Education and I'd like to thank you for watching this.